Okay, today is April 11, 2011. We're wrapping up learning module six. And when we last met, we talked about the rules of hearsay, actually the rules prohibiting hearsay. And we just touched upon some of the basic evidence rules on the issue of hearsay. And I'm going to talk about that in detail because hearsay is a big part of investigations. And I'm going to talk about investigations broadly this afternoon in the context not only of criminal investigations, but civil investigations as well. And that's what child protection specialists or intake workers do. The division, as I suggested last week, has to find out what happened in order for there to be services, in order for there to be inter an intervention, in order for you as child protection workers to take action to protect this child and protect other children who may be at risk for harm, and also to help the caregivers be better parents and be less likely to place their kids at risk. So you need to help the kids, and you need to correct the parental behavior that might put kids at risk. And in order to do that, you need to know what happened. Because when a caregiver says, I'm not doing what you want me to do, well, then you need to, you need to prove that something happened by a different standard than the criminal law. But nevertheless, you need to prove, you need to demonstrate to somebody, some decider, as President Bush might say, President Bush, the George W. Bush, uh, the last Bush, he was the chief decider, I think he said. Well, you need to prove to some decider, and in the case of uh, civil uh, prosecutions for child maltreatment within the family court, that decider is a family court judge. Can someone tell me what the burden of proof is in the family court when proving abuse or neglect in a fact-finding What's the standard of proof? Before you answer that, tell me what the standard of proof is in a criminal case where somebody might be put in jail or placed on probation after being convicted. What is the standard of proof to convict the defendant in the criminal courts of a crime? No, but you're close. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you. There are different standards of proof. And it's real important if you're the person who has the burden of proof. If you have the burden of proof, what the standard of proof is, is critical. And we talked about this indirectly when we talked about the fact that someone could be convicted, or rather acquitted. Someone could be acquitted or found not guilty in criminal court, yet be held responsible in civil court. And we gave the example of the OJ case. I gave the example of the OJ case. He was acquitted because the standard of proof was beyond a reasonable doubt. In the civil court, it was a preponderance of the evidence. Okay? Same thing in the family court in a fact finding. In the family court in a fact finding, the standard of proof for the deputy attorney general is a preponderance of the evidence. And that can make all the difference in the world. Because you only have to convince the fact finder, in family court that's the judge, you only have to convince her by a little bit more than half. A smudge, a spitch, just a little bit more. 50.0001%, or some might say 51%. If you think of a preponderance of the evidence as a little bit more than half, then it is 51%. And that's a rule of thumb that people use to help others conceptualize what a preponderance of the evidence means. To preponderate, if that's the right word, uh, preponderance is a little bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more. On the other hand, in a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And the metaphor that defense lawyers love to use to jurors and if I'm the defense lawyer and you're the jury, they will stand before you and say what the civil burden of proof is, just a smidge more than 50%. And in this case, my client, who's accused of these terrible things, you have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. The scales have to be dramatically, dramatically different. 
beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, there are some burdens of proof in between there, and nobody knows precisely how to quantify them. We kind of just kind of figure it out, shoot from the hip, and think of them relatively, relative to one another. Because Teddy mentioned the burden of proof a moment ago called clear and convincing evidence. Is that more than preponderance of the evidence? Is that a tougher standard of proof, Teddy? Or is that a more forgiving, easier to prove burden? Clear and convincing evidence or preponderance? Which one is tougher? And I think you're right. In fact, I know you're right. Clear and convincing evidence is a higher standard of proof than preponderance. So my right and left hand represent the scales. This is the metaphor. This might be preponderance, okay? Clear and convincing, reasonable doubt, okay? And for the record, I'm raising my right hand into the air and my left hand towards my feet. <laughs> In the absence of a video courtroom, one of the things they teach in law school, one of the more mundane things, is how to preserve the record because the recorder doesn't know what we're doing when we demonstrate a gesture. In any event, so you have preponderance, you have clear and convincing, you have beyond a reasonable doubt. The two standards of proof that you might encounter in the family court as a child protection worker, or if you're not a diagnosis worker and you're with me today, that a child protection worker might, encou might encounter are the preponderance and clear and convincing. Can someone tell me, since we've concluded that, clear and convincing is a tougher standard of proof than preponderance, what type of child protection proceeding that happens within the world of the Division of Youth and Family Services in the family courts of the state of New Jersey, what kind of proceeding might have the more rigorous standard of proof. Clear and convincing. Say it. Termination. Termination of parental rights. The standard of proof is clear and convincing evidence. Okay? And you might imagine why that is, right? Because that is a dramatic outcome for the caregiver who has their rights, their legal rights to care for their children terminated for all time. If that is the outcome, if that is the consequence, if that's what's going to happen if the plaintiff or the DAG prevails in this proceeding, then the proof needs to be significant. The burden of proof needs to be rigorous, and it is in New Jersey. It is. It is. It is clear and convincing evidence, and thus it is more rigorous and more demanding, more demanding than by a preponderance of the evidence. And of course, in the criminal courts, if that same caregiver who, whose parental rights are in jeopardy, jeopardy, and maybe they're in jeopardy because they committed some act of violence upon their children, they may find themselves from the same fact pattern in the criminal courts. Well, the prosecutor, she has to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and that takes a lot of persuading, and it requires that you convince a jury um, by that exacting and rigorous burden of proof. So those are your three common burdens of proof. There are a couple of other wacky ones that, again, have no real substance to them unless you look at them in the context of these other burdens of proof. Things like a prima facie case, P-R-I-M-A space F-A-C-I-E, prima facie, prima facie which I think is Latin, I don't know, it would be Italian, French. What it means is on the face, something like that, on its face. That's a very low standard of proof. It's, it's almost akin to some evidence. That's what the prosecutor has to show before the grand jury. You answer some questions on your examination about the grand jury. There are video clips that show you how the grand jury process works. Well, that group of 23 people in New Jersey that makes a decision as a grand jury, those folks have to be convinced that there's prima facie evidence, which simply means some evidence. Some evidence. Just something to hang your hat on. Something more than nothing.
So those are the burdens of proof. And those burdens of proof need to be satisfied if child protection is going to take action to protect this child or future children and help the parents be better caregivers in the future. Just because we say that abuse happened, just because we substantiated the abuse, doesn't mean we can compel these folks, these caregivers, to do what we want if they don't agree. If they don't agree with what the division wants, there needs to be litigation. And there needs to be proof. So when we get back down to it, child protection specialists or intake workers are investigators, man. It's not the way to look at it. You're investigators. Now, ultimately, the purpose for which you're investigating these acts is different from the purpose for which, obviously, law enforcement <coughs> investigates these acts. But the information that you are interested in is very similar. And its quality needs to be the same. You want good, satisfying, persuasive information. Because whether you're trying to convince a family court judge, or you're trying to convince a group of jurors, or some other fact finder or decider, you need to have some good evidence. It needs to be persuadable. People have to buy what you're selling. People have to believe in what you're saying. So you need to do a good job. You need to do a good investigation, whether you're an intake worker or a law enforcement detective. You need to, you need to do the best you can. You don't say, well, you know, you know, I am a child protection intake worker, and we're not going to punish these people. We're not here to hold them responsible for their behavior. So. I'm just going to investigate this case a little bit. I'm just going to get only as much as is necessary. Well, you never know how much is necessary until it's too late. So you need to do your best, your best job in trying to gather facts and information. And ultimately, whatever facts and information you develop is going to be scrutinized by some fact finder. And you know what? Just because it's a preponderance of the evidence, convincing a judge that something happened sometimes feels as challenging to deputies attorney general as convincing a jury that something happened. You know, you have these nice burdens of proof, and there is this significant difference between the criminal and civil burden of proof, but you still need to convince that judge, and it needs to be persuasive, as I said earlier. So taking a look at some of the basic aspects of criminal and civil investigations, we're going to think about how they work. I'm going to discuss them in broad strokes because there is an hour video that I have in learning module. I think it's five. Yeah. There's a video PowerPoint on investigations and my philosophy on what a good professional investigation is into child maltreatment, no matter who you are. CPS, a medical professional whose job it is for some reason to gather information, a law enforcement professional. There are a couple of things in there, and I think I point out what they are in that PowerPoint video presentation, that are not going to apply to child protection. Like, you're not going to seize evidence. You're not going to get out one of those ultraviolet blue lights and look for biological or residual. Okay, you're not going to look for semen or saliva or blood or those kinds of things. Those are things that law enforcement will do. That doesn't mean you ought not be aware that those capabilities are there. You may be working in tandem, jointly with law enforcement. You may see something when you're in somebody's home that you can share with law enforcement. You may know something that the child told you about the bed linens, about the bed linens, or where he molested her. Maybe he he molested her in the attic, which has a, a rug, and she mentions that he ejaculated on the rug, and that information didn't come out in the interview with law enforcement. But you know it because, because you had spoken to her before the full forensic interview, and that was something that was omitted for whatever reasons. Well, that rug ought to be looked at with that blue ultraviolet light. Now, I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself to make two points. One is there are some things that are uniquely law enforcement. Not a lot, but some are. 
And you're not going to be doing those things if you're a child protection specialist or intake worker or a diagnosis investigator. But you ought to know what they are. You ought to appreciate what these strategies include because you may have information that you might use jointly or share jointly with law enforcement that might make your case and the case more persuasive, more persuadable to the fact finder. So maybe the Sheriff's Department says, thank you very much. We did not hear that from her. We're going to come back with CSI and we're going to use the blue light and we're going to do a preliminary eval of what's going on in the attic on the rug. So I think it's important that child protection know these things, even the things that are beyond your capabilities or your role. So what is an investigation? It is a, it is a, a process where you are attempting to gather information about a past event in order to persuade, well, ultimately in order to persuade a judge or jury that this happened. You want to investigate the historical truth of maltreatment. You want to investigate the historical truth of maltreatment, that some act of maltreatment happened to this or some of the children in the home, this child or more than one child in the home. Because that information leads you to substantiation, which may lead you to proving by preponderance, working with a DAG before a family court judge, if this issue is litigated one day. So you're going to gather information. It seems quite simple. And the way you're going to do it is by asking people questions, by using your eyes, your senses, by going to the scene. We don't have to say the scene of the crime. We'll call it the scene. You need to go there, and you do. Workers do. You go into the home. You ask questions. You interview the child. The number one source of information in these cases is the child, right? If the child suffered physical abuse as well as sexual, sexual abuse or just physical abuse, you might not only question that child, you may observe that child. You may refer that child to the medical professionals who work with the division to look for injury to the child. Now, we're looking for injury to the child, number one, to protect that child. But that same injury that we discover that may need to be treated is evidentiary. It helps corroborate or demonstrate the historical truth of what happened to this child. Because ultimately we need to know what happened in order to treat and intervene, and also to prove one day if the caregivers challenge or dispute that there was in fact abuse. So you're going to interview witnesses, you're going to look at kids or your professionals that work with the division will indirectly you will indirectly look at the child where they will do an evaluation, a physical or medical evaluation of the child. Evidence will be gathered that way. Don't be afraid of the word evidence. I'm using it in its broadest sense. Information is evidence. Information that helps demonstrate the historical truth of the maltreatment needs to be gathered. I call it evidence. Call it what you want. Intake workers gather evidence every day. That's what you do. If you're an intake worker, you gather evidence. We can soften it up and call it information, call it what you want. We need to gather information about the historical fact of the maltreatment. And it includes talking to the child, talking to the mom, the caregiver, maybe the neighbors, teachers, siblings, classmates, grandparents, People, people who were part of this child's life at or about the time of the maltreatment. You need to talk to all of them, every one of them. Even people, even people who you think may not have information. Now, I'm not saying attract people down in far lands or uh, people who are long gone from the New Jersey area that there's really no... Uh, concrete connection to this case, but they happen to come in and out of the house during that time period? No. But if they're in the house, if they live on the third floor and you're investigating some abuse that happened on the second floor, and it's physical abuse, go upstairs and knock on a door. Ask a few questions. Talk to the teachers. Talk to all the teachers. Talk to the guidance counselors. Talk to the gym teacher. 
I don't know whether you do this routinely, and maybe you don't do it routinely, but that's the best way to do it. Okay? If you want to find out what happened, you need to evaluate all potential sources of information. And that includes persons that you may not have previously considered. So, you gather information and evidence from the child, from the witnesses and the people who were in that child's world at or about the time of the maltreatment, whether it be home, school, the community that that child exists in. You want to gather that information. You want to look for any kind of medical evidence of the abuse. Again, I'm painting with broad strokes. You may have to refer that child for medical evaluations, perhaps psychological evaluations. Now, psychology is not a good evidence-gathering mechanism. Psychology and mental health professionals are more about the, the well-being of that child, okay? The mental health of that child. And that's okay, it's important. Uh, what might happen is a child may give additional information to a mental health professional that you didn't know before that might make the abuse more um, understandable. It might lead you to something you didn't consider before. Imagine if the abuse happened not only in the family home, but during a mental health evaluation, the child discloses that a couple of times it happened in the back of school 18, in the car, with dad. Now, if you're in back of school 18 in Patterson, and you're working a joint investigation with the State County Prosecutor's Office and the Patterson Police, what might you say to the law enforcement personnel that you're working jointly with and that you have a relationship with? What might you say to them about what you learned from the mental health professional, and how might that make the quality of your case better? We now know the child reports that a couple of times dad sexually molested her in the back of school 18 in Patterson. After school let out, but before sundown. Any possibility of evidence? Did they find out if they had a camera? Yes, thank you. Not only find out if they do, it did. Every school in Patterson does have cameras. Everywhere. The captain of the Patterson School System Security, and I don't know what it's like in your communities, and not every school system clearly has cameras, but some school systems do. And I know for a fact in Patterson they do, and God willing, they're all working. But they keep up with them pretty good, and I know the captain of security there. And if you go into their uh, security offices, there's, there's a little Dell monitor for every school in real time. It may be on there. And guess what? For all the things you did, every grandma you spoke to, every teacher, every guidance counselor, every time you spoke to that child, for all of the home visits that you did, for all of the questions that you uh, engaged in with mom, for all the things that you did over the past three weeks or three days or however um, long this investigation is, one little clip of tape might make it all make sense. One little clip of tape can solve the whole thing. Because there are very few things that are dispositive. By dispositive, that's a word that means totally conclusive. End of issue. Smoking gun. If you've got a video of the stepfather mauling her in the car, what happened is no longer an issue. All that's left is how do we deal with this, right? But up until that point, what happened is always an issue. And even when the video's there, it's always an issue, but it's pretty good. It's virtually as positive. Let's put it that way. Mikhail? No, not the psychological evaluation. Um, most of our clients don't like doing that because they say that the um, psychologists will take their information from their past and use it against them. I recommend things like, like let's say the client said they used to smoke weed. Right. And the psychologist would recommend that you know, they go through um, substance abuse. Excuse me. So Michaela says many of the clients do not embrace mental health professionals. They don't embrace psychology. They don't want to talk to somebody. And for good reason. Because if they tell the whole story 
about their lives. Every now and then, there are consequences. If they talk about smoking pot, you got to deal with it. You just can't let them smoke pot still. You know? And they know that. So either they lie, or withhold, or be less than cooperative, or they, they tell the truth. And the likelihood is, unfortunately, that they will at least uh, massage the truth, uh, not give the whole truth. They may talk about having sexual relations with boys. Uh, or they may not. They may withhold that. They may lie. They mis may misrepresent that. Yeah. The psychologist or the mental health professional wants to know it all. And that is kind of problematic because we know we haven't gotten there yet. We're going to talk about it later. But you know that confidentiality is the grease that makes, that makes therapy work. And in the world of a child, many of the things that they say about their life and lifestyle at that point have to be dealt with. And you can't keep them confidential. And thus children, they really don't get the, 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 the right experience for mental health interventions. It's sad, but it's just a fact of life. You can't have a 13-year-old going in there who's having unprotected sex with multiple boys in school. You can't have a kid who's using drugs and abusing drugs at that age, any age. So it, it, it is a difficult uh, process for kids to go into therapy. You're right. So in any event, you, you, you want to gather evidence. You gather it from witnesses. You gather it from kids uh, who have allegedly been abused. You look for it from a variety of sources. You never rule out anybody or anyone, including grandparents and extended family. They all might have some information that they can share with you. At worst, you know, it is not helpful and you simply don't use it. You don't use it. Some of the things, and I'm not going to go over that whole video, and you must watch it, but some of the things that you need to know about, just practical aspects, is you need to respond immediately. Now, it doesn't always work out that way, but I am telling you what the ideal is. A good investigation involves an immediate response. Tomorrow is too late, especially in the world of child abuse and child maltreatment, where the issues are so emotionally charged where there is so much potential for withholding information, for retracting information, for people interfering in the flow of information. The only time is now. Tomorrow is too late. So immediate response is critical. When it happens, most of the time it does. But if you want to do a competent investigation, you want to do a good investigation, you want to do an investigation that is defensible, then you need to respond immediately, and you need to gather up all of the parties who have potentially information about this case. And in the typical case that involves, let's make it a hybrid, that it involves physical abuse as well as sexual abuse. Well. Again, you're going to be working with the prosecutors on these cases in all likelihood. But the way law enforcement would work this jointly is we would gather up everybody as soon as possible. Okay? The child, the caregiver, the um, expected non-offending caregiver, we'll call that person. We don't know. We don't know. There's no non-offending caregiver until way down the line of the investigation then you could begin thinking in terms of a non-offending caregiver. But when one caregiver betrays the child, the potential for the other caregiver to either be directly involved or indirectly involved, or indifferent or uncaring about what happened, or to make poor decisions about how to stop what they may have known or suspected was happening, they may have made those poor decisions, they're not non-offending until you completely rule them out. In any event, you bring them in or you go talk to them. You need to talk to the child immediately, not tomorrow. This is the day that she decided to tell. This is the day and the time she decided to let it out. She decided to let it out in school to this lady. Not to you, not to me, not to mom, not to the library, not to her big brother, not to her pastor. This lady. We don't know why, but this lady. She needs to be spoken to. Not tomorrow. Not it's 4 o'clock and she's got to go home and she lives up in upstate New York or downstate New Jersey. We need to speak to her right away. Now, we need to know what that child said and how she said it. 
in our world, in the world of child maltreatment investigations, we call that person that the child told the fresh complaint witness. The fresh complaint witness. You want to remember that. The fresh complaint witness. And that simply means the person that the child told other than the authorities about the abuse. The person that the child told, other than the authorities, and by authorities I mean everybody, I guess school teachers, prosecutors, police officers, other than representatives in the system, they wouldn't be fresh complaint witnesses. A fresh complaint witness in the world of child maltreatment is someone other than the authorities that the child told about the abuse. Very often, it's the person who called it in, or the person who reported it, or the person who started the ball rolling. Now, I want you to know, it's one of the distinctions that are in the learning module objectives, that the fresh complaint witness that I described is not a true fresh complaint witness under the law. The law refers to a fresh complaint witness in a very different way. This is a term of art or a off-label use of the term, to use a medical or medicine metaphor. The true fresh complaint was as follows. This goes back 150 years or more. It was a uh, rule of evidence, basically. And the true fresh complaint involved an adult victim of rape. And Throughout the years, today included, adult women and men, people who were sexually assaulted, forcibly sexually attacked by another person. Those people typically don't report it, by the way. Not quite like kids who sometimes don't report it for years and years. But they certainly don't run to the police officer immediately. Very often there's a delay of maybe a day, two days, three days, and sometimes adult survivors of sexual aggression don't report it for weeks or months, or never. But even back in the day, back in the 20th century and the 19th century, legal scholars recognized that women, mostly women that are the subject of rapes that are under consideration in fresh complaint analysis, legal scholars, even back in the day, recognized that women don't report it right away. So the rules of evidence allowed a bit of what would typically be hearsay to be admissible in court. Remember, hearsay was a statement made outside the courtroom, said by someone sitting in the courtroom. That is, the statement's made outside the courtroom, it's repeated in the courtroom by someone other than the person who said it. So in the case of a fresh complaint, let's go back, it's 1920, the era, the era of uh, the flappers and the Roaring Twenties, and some woman was sexually assaulted in New York City in the bathroom of a speakeasy. She doesn't tell somebody right away. When she goes home, she's so upset, she takes 10, 15 different showers. When she wakes up in the morning, she goes into her roommate's room, and she says, roommate, I don't want to tell you, but I was at that speakeasy last night, and that, that, that big guy... That big guy who lives up on 110th Street, Duke, Duke took me in the bathroom there and he raped me. But I didn't go to the cops and I'm afraid of him because he's a wise guy, he's a mobster, and I don't want anything to do with him, but he raped me. I don't know what to do. She tells her roommate that. Somehow it comes out there's a trial a year later, two years later. Well, the roommate, we'll call the roommate Carla. Daniela asks Carla through the prosecutor to testify. Carla comes in to say what Daniela said. Daniela says, I was at the speakeasy. I was raped by that guy Duke from 110th Street. I'm afraid of him because he's a wise guy or a mobster. Carla would be sitting in the witness chair telling us what Daniela told her. Even in the early 20th century, in the 1920s, the rules of evidence allowed the roommate to come in and say what happened because the law recognized that many rape victims don't tell right away. However, it was a very narrow exception to hearsay. In that, it had to be a fresh complaint. 
And the rule for adult rape victims is as follows. The statements that would normally be hearsay of a victim of rape that were made a short time after the event to someone they would normally turn to for advice or counsel are admissible. To rebut or to answer the thought by the jury that she must be making it up because she didn't tell somebody. Because when the jury goes into the jury room, they go, well, why didn't you tell somebody? She waited two days to go to the cops. If I heard that once, I've heard it a million times in what we do. She waited three days. She waited a week. She didn't tell right away. Right? They used that against the victim. So even back in the early 20th century, in fact, this goes back even further to the 19th century. Even back then, they said, you know what? If there's a fresh complaint, if the victim makes a statement about the fact of the rape to someone that persons would normally go to for advice or counsel or understanding, and it's fresh or it happens a short time after the rape, it could be admissible. That's what your real, that's what fresh complaint is, the word fresh and complaint. It's a complaint that's fresh, freshly after the rape. In our 2011 world of the 21st century in child maltreatment, we're talking about anybody the child told other than the authorities. It has nothing to do with fresh or rape or complaints who they would normally turn to, they might tell a playmate. You know, they might tell a, their, their playmate's cousin who was cool and hanging out because she was here for the summer. It doesn't matter who the person is. And the reason why we want that information is important. I'm switching back to child maltreatment investigations, what we're talking about here today. I wanted to distinguish the adult rape survivor, fresh complaint, which was the traditional rule of evidence with the fresh complaint in child abuse cases. In child abuse cases, is there one fresh complaint or could there be more than one? Child abuse. It could be more than one. It could be more than one. It could be more than one. In the child abuse case, the fresh complaint witness is someone that the child told other than the authorities about what happened. They could have told their boyfriend in 2004. They could have told their best friend in 2006. They could have told uh, uh, their guidance counselor yesterday. You got three fresh complaints. Okay, three fresh complaints, and none of them are really that fresh, but that's not what it's about. It's probably best understood as a prior complaint, a prior complaint. Did you tell someone else? Did you tell someone in the past? Is there someone else that you told between when it last happened or when it was happening and today? And many, many times the kid says, yeah, this person or that person. Then you want to find this person or that person. It's hard enough to convince people that this kid was molested or raped or exploited without ignoring good evidence. And juries like that kind of stuff, too. This kind of stuff doesn't feel like evidence because they weren't there. They don't know what happened. They're just somebody that the kid supposedly told. But what it does do is, if the defense is that she's making it up now, then how did the witness have the foresight to tell someone in the past. A prior consistent statement, a prior statement, a statement from the past that's consistent with what the witness is saying now can be very persuasive. That's a good piece of evidence. And I've made that argument lots of times in front of juries. Now, does it win the day? Who knows? Is it important? Yeah. Do juries factor that in? You bet they do. They factor that in as much as they would saying, how come she didn't tell somebody? Well, she never told anybody. She waited all this time. Why didn't she tell somebody? Well, she did. And sometimes the person will say, and she said, please don't tell my mama. Please don't tell my mama. If this is somebody who is manipulating the defendant, if this is somebody who has some hidden agenda, who's out to get dad or get Uncle Mario or has some motive other than the truth, right? If this statement about being molested was designed to hurt this man, why would she tell the person that she said, don't tell anybody? And why would she say it in an emotional way? Because it's true. And because it really happened. And they just wanted it to stop. And they wanted somebody who could help them and understand them and give them some advice. That kind of statement is very powerful 
It's a very powerful rebuttal or answer. So the suggestion that she's making it up because daddy wouldn't let her go out on a Friday night, or daddy caught her with a condom, or daddy caught her watching porno movies, or daddy caught her smoking weed or cigarettes, or whatever. In every case where incest is alleged, the accused will say that the victim is fabricating, not in every case, in many cases, there's a, a few different angles that are played by persons accused who are guilty, who are guilty. Sometimes they're innocent, not that gullible, but very rare. So there are lots of defenses. The biggest one is the child has a malicious motive. She's out to get him for some reason. Well, what better than a prior statement, especially an emotional statement, last year, last month, three or four years ago. So that's another important witness for that reason. The other reason is it gives us a window, a snapshot, if you will, into the credibility of this kid's accusation. When I first came to the child abuse unit, I had tried a bunch of different cases and been involved in a lot of different prosecutions from domestic violence and batterings and shootings and homicides and, you know, they were pretty cases. And I had to make a lot of decisions, not too many because I was early in my career, but I had to make decisions that affected people. But when I came to this unit and they said, you know, you're in charge, you're supervising, you have to make decisions. I was like, oh man, there is no worse allegation to get wrong than accusing someone of molesting a kid. None. I'll give you, maybe it's a funny story. One day, my colleague, she was the editor of the Herald News. Her father started the newspaper. She was the courthouse reporter. She didn't have to be. She enjoyed the courthouse beat. Her father owned the newspaper, Diane Haynes. When I first started out my career, Diane Haynes worked at the courthouse. And they had made an error. They, they had reported on a case that I was prosecuting of child sexual abuse. And they put the name of the guy in the newspaper, but they put the wrong dude's picture. <laughs> the picture of the man they used was a homeless man who stomped another dude to death. He hit him in his brain so many times with his boot that he killed the guy. He wanted the record cleared. <laughs> Now, he didn't molest no child, man. He only stopped the dude's death, you know? Don't you get beat up in prison? Yes, you're not very popular in the jail if you're a child molester. So there is no worse accusation to get wrong for a prosecutor than child sexual abuse, right? Nothing worse in the book. So I said to myself, oh, geez, I don't, I don't want to make a mistake. How do you know? How do you know? Now, I went to the shooting because I had a little experience with these cases and I was interested in them and I found them challenging. But I still said to myself when I was going home this first, first few weeks staring at the ceiling going, how will I know, man? What if I mess up? And one of the things that I realized right away was the number one issue that I wanted to know was how did it come out? What was the context of the disclosure? Fancy words for who did they tell for the first time that it got to the authorities? Who did they tell so we got the case? Who did they tell so the police or prosecutor or dykes got involved? Who did they tell and what prompted them? What happened? And I learned right away that that would give me great confidence in whether I had a quality case, whether I had a case that was believable and persuadable. I wanted to know, excuse me, why now? Why today? What motivated that child to come forward today? Was it the fact that they felt safe, maybe, because the molester was no longer in the home? Was it the fact that the molestation had reached new heights, new levels of intrusiveness, that they couldn't take it anymore? Was it the fact that they were now autonomous or felt strong and powerful and not fearful or vulnerable anymore? What was it? Or was it related to the fact that she got caught smoking weed in bed with a boy. Now, unfortunately, very often the disclosure arises out of those kinds of familial conflicts where the child is caught doing something bad or wrong or undesirable. 
It doesn't make it easier for us. That doesn't mean that we don't believe it, but it's very hard to prove it to the decider down the road, to the judge or the jury down the road. Roland Summit talks about that in the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. This is known to child maltreatment professionals for years and years, and that is that often familial conflict is the catalyst for the disclosure. How could you get in bed with that boy? Don't you know you can have diseases? Sex acts are only for grown-ups. You're not going out for the next six months. I'm taking away your car. I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. Wait till I tell your father. Yeah? I'll tell you something too, Mom. Your dad, your husband's a pig. He's this and that. F you, F that. And in the middle of this conflict, she blurts out that your husband's been molesting me. How does that have credibility? It's very difficult to have credibility. But at that time, the kid is so backed up against the wall that she sees this as the best time, when in fact it's the worst time, to make that disclosure. And it's unfortunately common. Common. So, you want to find out how it came out. What was the fresh complaint? Who did they say it to? You want to know as much about the dynamics of that process as possible. The other reason is, uh, we're on reason three or four, and they're all in that video that I made. The other reason is if you're going to interview that child, you can get a sense of how they feel about the abuse. Why they told, the manner in which they told, what they say. They said, please go tell my mama. Or they said, I just wanted to stop. Or please go go to the cops. Remember, you need to talk to this child. You need to connect with this child. The more you know about how they said it and to who they said it and the suspected reasons for saying it, the better armed you are for doing an effective interview of the child. We talked about that last week, the informed interview versus the blind interview. So this gives us, gives us information. This gives us information about how to best conduct the interview. Again, that same fresh complaint witness or witnesses. They are jam-packed with nutrition. Take my word. Lots of good stuff comes from those interviews. Lots of good stuff. So you want to interview them for all the reasons I said. They give you a window into credibility of the accusation. They can be evidence of a prior consistent statement that may make the child or witness more believable down the line. They may give us insight into how the child feels about the abuse, how to approach that child when you interview them, what are the kind of things you might say to that child. The fresh complaint witness. Who did they say it to and how did they say it? What was their motivation for coming forward? Did someone else come up with another reason why you might want to know what they said and who they said it to? The fresh complaint witness. What kinds of things does that help us with? That information. How does it make it more likely or more persuasive that this child may have been touched or sexually abused if they told someone in the past? Well, that's a good point. She can't describe what was said. She confirmed that it was said to her that the child confided in her. And it's part of that whole consistent statement thing. She can say, well, the child said to me, he came up in the attic and did it this way, he did that, and he always would yell at her and take away the, you know, her bike if she didn't do it, and that would be corroborative of what the child says now. So she can add some value in that way, that the, her recollection of what the child said to her can be corroborative of what the child says now, right? Something before, think, Something before in time yes. is corroborative of what she's saying now, and that's, that's part of the prior consistent statement, the prior consistent statement, or, fre or fresh complaint statement. What else? I, I, would, I would think sometimes the fresh complaint witness, uh, <clears throat> in my experience, may also have encouraged that child and be a support for that child to be able to talk to authorities as well. Yes, uh, Teddy says that fresh complaint witness is an important person to connect with because they may have been a support for the child at the time of disclosure, perhaps before the disclosure, and in the future. And you want to connect with that person because they may be your ally. And that's an important point. That is a residual or benefit that's a little bit different from directly supporting the abuse, or that they are a corroboration witness to the abuse. They are important in a different aspect because 
A supported witness is a good witness. A kid who feels supported and that they have someone who believes in them is going to be a far better witness in the future than a kid who feels abandoned and a kid who feels unsupported. And unfortunately, the last place that the child will get support is from the people who are compelled by nature, nurture, God, and family to do that. Mom, siblings, cousins. They're the, they're the people who are attacking her. So someone like the teacher or the guidance counselor or the primary fresh complaint, the one that prompted the case, as Teddy points out, I think, is a critical person to connect with as a worker or as a law enforcement professional because sometimes that's all the kids got. And the kid picked them, right? That's the person they went to. So that usually suggests a connection between the child and that person. And you may be able to leverage that connection into a child maybe lasting a little bit longer down the road. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Carmen says that these people are typically disinterested, they're not related to the case, and in a case where emotions run high and people got all kinds of motives to say what they say, this person typically has no advantage from getting involved in this thing and adds a, a level or a layer of, of believability um, uh, that um, can be real helpful to, to having the judge or the, or the jury believe, to believe that these, um, these events happen. So that fresh, fresh complaint witness helps us understand what motivated the child too. It helps us understand what their thinking process was, how they feel about the case, the kind of witness you're going to be dealing with. So you want to pay close attention to them. What about little kids? What do we worry about with preschoolers? There's a real different reason why we want to interview and memorialize and document what went down with this fresh complaint witness. What is the thing that we talked about at length over the past few weeks? And in forensic interviewing, we spent almost the whole class worrying about this. Thank you, folks. Suggestibility. Why is that relevant to what the fresh complaint did or didn't do? Go ahead. You say it's just a little If they weren't, if they were not, what word did you just say earlier? No, we Yeah. If they weren't suggestible. On the other hand, if they were suggestible, then that's an issue as well. So in, in a class of witnesses that are vulnerable to adult influence, we need to look at the persons who interacted with that child to examine that fresh complaint process for suggestibility. Now, as an advocate for the child, you want to show that there was no suggestion. Now, the defense is hoping that if we go talk to them, they go, oh, and she didn't do much talking. All I did was say, did he put his finger in your butt? Did daddy put his finger in your butt? You know, he got in trouble for that once. Is he a, is he, did he do that? You need to look at these persons, especially in the cases of preschoolers and first and second graders, but with all children, but especially with those kids who are more vulnerable to suggestion, to rule out suggestion. Because... You know, when you're looking at the teen and the tween, the defense is, ah, he wouldn't let me go out, uh, she's out to get him because of this, because of that, because she's sleeping with boys, because she's watching the porn, she's smoking weed, all those things. The little ones, the defense is suggestion. So we want to kind of rule out suggestion. We want to make sure that that guidance counselor who was oh so important in supporting that child didn't stick these words down the child's throat. Because that's what the defendant's going to say. That's what the abusive caregiver is going to say that this child was manipulated by some um, guidance counselor or school personnel or person from the school 
who um, influenced the child. So that's another reason why we need to gather uh, the details of what happened. Now, if you feel I'm belaboring the point, I, I know I am, but I don't know that you can really overstate how important this freshman play witness is. It is really the bread and butter of what, what I do and what my, my unit does. Uh, this, is, this is a person and persons who help us put this whole thing in context for all of the reasons I just said. Now, when you say, well, what do you ask them, that's in that video, but some of the things that you want to know is, how did you come out? What did the child say? What did you say? What did they say? What did you say? Tell me about what happened. Very often that witness, child protection workers will say, I don't remember, I don't remember. Well, ma'am, guidance counselor, Cynthia, I'm not asking you verbatim what happened. Are you broadcasting me to Central Africa with that little thing in your ear? No. no okay. <laughs> You're going to say, listen, Cynthia, I don't expect you to remember word for word what happened there, but what I, what I do expect is that you remember the gist of what was said. You know, what, what, what was the gist of it? What was, the, uh, what was it like? What did she say? Not the exact words. You don't have to give the exact words. Ask for um, the gist of what she said. Okay? And they'll be able to do that. And, and these people go, well, I don't remember. I don't remember. It was just yesterday. You know? I don't expect you to be a computer and remember every word, word for word, but I expect you to remember how it came up. You know, I mean, how often in your life does an eight-year-old girl come to your office and tell you that her father's having sexual intercourse with her? You think you might remember that? You know, now you wouldn't get flipping as wise as I'm suggesting there, but I find it hard to believe that some folks, other than that they don't want to get involved, don't remember that moment. At the very least, I want to know what motivated them. And I, I think I gave the example in the video clip of what I called Dr. Grandma cases and maybe Aunt Cynthia cases. Dr. Grandma is the grandmother, the grandmother of the child who believes that her daughter, okay, that her daughter, Gabriella, makes all the worst choices when it comes to going out with men. That this guy that she's going out with, Jerry's a bum. She can't stand him. And she heard at the beauty parlor that he wants to touch the girl in North Carolina. That's right, she heard that. <laughs> and she knows that he's been in trouble for drugs. He's a bum. Like okay, any questions about where we are so far? I want to go back to hearsay now, okay? Hearsay is another issue that is primarily a law enforcement issue and an attorney issue because the rules against hearsay govern what the jury can hear in court. And they also govern what the family court judge can hear in the family court, although last week we kind of agreed that they don't follow the rules as closely as they probably should within the family court. But I suggested to you, and I still suggest, that when the stakes are high, that there's going to be strict attention paid to hearsay. Like in a termination of parental rights case, they're not going to let in hearsay as much as they might in a fact-finding hearing. In any event, a hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered by a witness in court other than the person who made that statement to prove the truth of the matter. Now, we used some examples today and last week the police officer, Officer Mott, who comes into court and testifies about what the student said to him at school. Let's say the student, Daniela, tells Officer Mott at school, I don't like my Uncle Mario. He comes in my room and touches my titties. Later at a hearing, Officer Mott is called in to say what Danielle said. That would be hearsay. The best witness would be Danielle. Officer Mott didn't experience it. He's stating in court an out-of-court statement, Daniela's statement in court, to prove that her breasts were touched by her Uncle Mario. And the reason we don't allow that stuff in is because it's considered unreliable. It's not considered trustworthy. Hearsay is not considered to be trustworthy. Having said that, there are a number of exceptions to the hearsay rule. We began, or ended last week, and began our discussion of hearsay by the medical diagnosis exception. Remember, there is an exception for hearsay statements that are made to a doctor if they are made to further treatment. If there's a treatment motive for the person who makes the statement. 
And remember, I said that if you are going to the doctor because you're having chest pain and you want it to stop and you're afraid you're having a heart attack, you're not going to lie and tell him that you're having shooting pains in your calf. You know, there's no motive to lie. In fact, there's a tremendous motive to be accurate and truthful because you want to get better. There are other examples. There are other examples within the law of statements that have extra reliability. You can make a note of this. A hearsay exception typically has extra reliability. Hearsay statements that are exceptions to the hearsay rule. That is, even though they're hearsay, courts let them come in. They let the witness testify about what some other witness said. Those exceptions typically have enhanced reliability or super reliability. Something about them makes those statements more believable. They're extra believable. You want to put it in layperson's terms? Hearsay exception statements are extra believable. A statement made to the doctor because you want to get treated is extra believable. Because there is a motive to tell the truth. <coughs> One of the statements that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years that is considered an exception to the hearsay rule is the dying declaration. Now you're not going to see many of these in child abuse cases. But in order to appreciate the hearsay rule a little bit better, it is a nice example of a traditional hearsay exception that is rooted in its extra believability. Its extra believability. And the exception is somewhat like this. When somebody is dying, when death is imminent, they're about to die, they're more likely to make statements that are true. They're more likely to make a truthful statement because no one wants to meet their maker. No one wants to go wherever we go when we pass on. No one wants to meet their maker. No one wants to go to the great beyond with a lie on their lips. And there's kind of, even today, some attraction to that statement or philosophy or thoughts. You know, you, the last thing you want to do is when you're dying, you know, you want to hedge your bets a little, whatever you believe, right? You don't want to lie minutes before you're going to die. If any time's a good time to tell a truthful statement, it's when you're about to die. Right? I think that makes some sense even today. Back when this law was fashioned in, in the um, you know, 17th century England, when religion and the role of God in the church was much more powerful than it is today, when people believe all kinds of superstitions about our bodies and about the world and what its shape was and, and our place, it was even more impactful. Okay. So no one wants to die with a lie on their lips. Thus, a statement made on the brink of death is admissible as an exception to the hearsay rule. But like the treatment motive, just because you made a statement to a doctor doesn't mean it's admissible. You have to make a statement to a doctor because you wanted to get treated, because you needed medicine, because you had pain. Right? Well, when you're dying, it's not the fact of death that's imminent. That is, it's not, the only issue isn't whether you're going to die, it's whether you believe you're going to die. If you believe death is imminent, if you believe you're about to die, then that statement may be admissible as an exception to your symbol. It doesn't matter whether you in fact die or not. It doesn't matter if you weren't even in death's harm, if you weren't even in peril's way, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter whether you're going to die at all. If you truly believe you're going to die, that's all that matters. And you make a statement. So it's not really that relevant if you were really going to die. What's relevant is you thought you were really going to die. Switch it around. If you were really going to die and you didn't know it, you're like, oh no, I'm going to survive. This ain't nothing, man. It's, a, it's just a graze. It's the bullet scrape. And everybody's looking at you. You ever see these war movies? You're like, don't worry. Yeah, am I going to live? Oh, everything's okay. And you can't have your body's laying on the battlefield. <laughs> if you think you're going to live, doesn't apply. You have to truly believe you're going to die. 
I want to show you a video clip, and I want you to tell me whether this man who makes this statement has a valid hearsay exception. Now, in this case, the police officers would be called to testify. it's important for child protection intake workers and law enforcement and for persons who investigate offenses to understand what deputy attorney generals and prosecutors need in court is because you're on the front lines. You are going to document what you observe. You're going to document what you hear. You're going to file reports. One day the DAG is going to be sitting in court or the prosecutor is going to be sitting in court and they're going to rely on what you write. And there may be legitimate statements of witnesses that are admissible that the DAG didn't think about. But because you recorded them, because you documented the facts in a professional way, in a way that makes it clear that the, there is a hearsay exception that applies, they may be able to use this information that they didn't think they could use. So this is about documentation as much as it is about investigation. So you know what the hearsay exception is now. You know what that hearsay exception is. I just went through it in great detail what the dying declaration hearsay exception is. You're writing your report. You're writing your 9-7. You're punching away those keys in the NJ spirit. What facts, what facts are you going to put in your report that show three things, basically? Number one, that somebody made a statement, okay? that somebody made a statement about a relevant issue. Number two, that that statement was made by the person in contemplation of or with the knowledge that they were dying. And number three, that that statement was made in a context where they were likely to die. Now remember I said it doesn't matter whether they were to die in fact, but there has to be some evidence that there was a dying context, right? So number one, you have to show, and it needs to be documented, that there was a statement made about a relevant issue. Well, that's the easy part. The next thing you need to show is that the person who made it was likely to die and that he knew it. What facts, what 
facts that you just see that you could write in your report, and there are more than one, that show that the guy was dying and that he knew he was going to die. Go ahead, over here. The priest was on his way. Stop. The priest was on his way. Who said that? You don't even know the exact name, but what person was it? Do you remember? The officer. The officer. Okay. The officer who was uh, updating the detectives as they were walking through the hallway of the hospital, right? He said, the priest is on his way, right? What else? The fact that he was saying the praying the hell man. Who was praying? The victim. I mean, the, the perp. Okay, let's stop right there. One of the police officers says the priest is on his way. The perpetrator, the accused perpetrator, is saying the Hail Mary. Let's stop right there. We'll worry about other facts in a moment. So we're going to document these things. The police officer who said the priest has been called and he's on his way, or words to that effect, who did he say that to? The detectives. What brought that up? Was there anything about the context of it? Why did he say that? Because they asked him how he was doing. That's right. They asked him how he was doing. The detectives asked the patrol officer how he was doing. So we get a little bit more facts. So if we know that, our report ought to reflect that the detectives, now we're assuming we're on mission and we know everything that happened, okay? You don't always know everything that happened. But assuming you know these facts, the detectives inquired about the state of the declarant. The declarant's the guy who said the statement. The detectives inquired or asked about the health of the man who made the statement, and the police officer said, the priest is on his way. That's nice, but what does that mean? So the priest's on his way. The priest, so what does that mean? Maybe he's coming for dinner. Maybe he's going to the cafeteria. Last rites. What does last rites mean? Did you get before you die? So the last rites is something that you get before you die in the Christian religion, right? So in the Christian religion, it's a sacrament. It's something that you get before you die, and when when people know they're going to die, they ask for the priest. Or, have you ever heard or had a loved one where they call for the priest at the hospital, sadly enough? The hospital sometimes will dispatch the priest. The person doesn't ask, or the family doesn't ask. The doctors know that the family wants to know, so the doctors send the priest. So the priest tells us two things, really. Let's assume that the person who's laying in the bed asked because he wants the sacrament that's called uh, extra unction, I think, going back to my Catholic school days. Is that extra unction? Oh, that marriage? What is that? What? Anointing of sick? No, no. Well, it may be called that too in some. But there is a sacrament called extra unction. Weird word. And I, I think it might be the last right. But in any event, whatever it is, in the Catholic rites, there's this process that people go through. Let's assume that the man laying in the bed asked for, for the priest. And very often they do. I remember my grandma had to get the priest. I want the priest. You know, that's okay. So you ask for the priest. So what, what does that show us? That should show us two things, right? The two most important things. What does it show us? He knows that, or he, well, he believes he's going to die. And he's probably going to die, right? I mean, there's, they're not gonna, the hospital's not going to send priests to everybody who asked for it unless... There's kind of a tacit agreement that something's going on, right? So death is in the air, and he knows it. One fact, but there's more. He's saying the Hail Mary. What's that all about, Carl? Oh, it's asking forgiveness before you die. So what does that tell us? So he's asking forgiveness before you die. Maybe an atheist is reading your report. What about him? What? And what does that tell us about hearsay exceptions? It's, it just follows. He believes he's dying. He believes he's dying. Why would he say Hail Mary if he didn't believe he was dying? So the, the subject, the declarant, believes he's dying. And another piece of evidence to show that he believes he's dying is that he's beginning to recite a prayer. Okay? What else tells us that death is imminent or that he knows death is imminent or both? In the back. Well, yeah, he's in the ICU, okay? He's got two bullet wounds to his chest, okay? We saw him get shot. We're aware of that. The medical records, I mean, I would put it in the report that he had. Let's say you debrief the doctor. He goes, 
He's got two bullets. One is in his heart, and we can't operate on The other one's in his liver. So he got shot in the center of his body with two bullets. I think that's important, right? That has to do with death. That is, death may be likely. He's in the hospital. What else tells us that death is in the air? Someone else. Someone else. What about him? Just looking at the facts. What did you see? Was he doing a big dance? Was, what was he doing? Was he chatting with them? What is something you're going to write that's, that's tangible, that's a powerful uh, piece of evidence that, that speaks to the situation there? Go ahead, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. He was straining. He was having a hard time speaking. His voice was really low. At times, he used no words at all. He simply... Did he nod assertively and like right on or no? These little things are important. There's a big difference between he nodded no with, there's a big difference between he nodded no to he nodded no painfully or slowly and painfully. Barely nodded no. Blinked his eyes, right? You, you need to paint a picture here when you're documenting this stuff. Whatever you may document. And nobody expects you to be, uh, you know, Hemingway or uh, Joseph Conrad or, or whoever. What, what we do expect is that you identify the relevant facts and write them down. And, and the word is not creative, but be detailed. Be detailed. And if you know going in what's important, if you ever go to the scene where there's a dying declaration, you'll know what to do now. And to today, you will. You'll know what facts are important. You'll know what details are important. What else says to us in that situation? See, he had difficulty breathing. He had difficulty breathing. What else? Carmen? Volunteer the information without being asked. He told them that he murdered someone. Great didn't murder them without anyone asking him. Right, but how does that show he knows he's going to die? I guess because of the gravity of what he was saying, who the heck says that? By somebody who thinks he's clear in his conscience. Okay, I like that. He offered a statement about an unrelated case because we can infer that he's clearing his conscience. And who clears his conscience? He wouldn't be walking, you know, having a few cocktails. And, oh, by the way, I killed Susie Jones. I'm going to get off that off my chest. You seem like a lovely person. <laughs> no. If you think you're going to die, that's the kind of thing you might offer, right? Any other facts that we watch that are suggestive of death and knowing that you're going to die? Oh. He was hooked up to a lot of medical machines. Yeah, he was, he, was, uh, he was not only in a hospital, but he was on a lot of um, medical assistance machines. Right? And that told us something. And he knows it. It's one thing to be, they wheel you in a wheelchair, oh, it's okay, relax, it'll be okay. It's another thing. You're back there, you can barely speak, there's machines, there's IVs, there's things all in your body, right? Now you gotta be thinking, I think I'm gonna die. I think I'm gonna die every time I get a pain. You know? So if they had me in that hospital with things in my nose and machines in me, and I just got shot, I, I it'd be relevant to me that all these machines are beeping and making noise. And I'm hooked up to that, right? That that's part of the equation. What else? Anything else? Did he say something else, or did the cops say something else? If he didn't know at all what his predicament was, did um, the cops hold him? What was the African American cop's name? I always liked it too. He's good. He's good. I think he gets killed in the end of one way or another. It's four years ago. Come on. <laughs> They didn't even on this one anymore. What did he say, Al? He said, well, why don't you tell us about something before you, before you pass? Or... Yeah, before you check out or something. He tells them, you're going to die, so you might as well tell us what's going on before you die. So if the guy was clueless, he let him know what was what. <laughs> and, you know, we're not going to judge, man. We're just going to document. We're just going to write down what it is that makes that statement hearsay. Uh, excuse me, a hearsay exception. Now I want to give you another example. Another example that you might see in child maltreatment more than you would see a dire declaration. Actually, there's two of them, and they're kind of related, and I'll tell you them both. One of them is what's called a contemporaneous statement. A contemporaneous statement. That's another hearsay exception. And I call that the sports narrator exception. If somebody is 
making a statement about what's unfolding before their eyes at the time it's unfolding before their eyes, that's a contemporaneous statement. And when people do that, the courts have found that that is less likely to be phony or made up or unreliable. Conversely, it's more likely to be reliable. I just saw a student walk past me. She's walking towards the ladies' room now. As I'm narrating what the student's doing, right, that would be a hearsay exception. If I said what she did two hours from now, that would not be a contemporaneous statement. Contemporaneous means at the same time. People who make statements at the same time that they're viewing something, well, those statements can be an exception to the hearsay rule. They're considered more reliable because there isn't much time to make stuff up, right? There isn't much time to get it wrong. You're watching it unfold. So there's less time to reflect and fabricate, and there is more likely, it's more likely you're going to get it right you're out watching it and narrating. That's why I call it the sportscaster exception. You know? The sportscaster exception. Okay? Here comes Derek Rose. He's bringing up the ball. He's past the midcourt line. He's hitting the ball down low, passing it down low. Okay? You're saying what's happening as it's happening. No. That's all I can think of right away. Yes, from the Chicago Bull fan. I was trying to think of the guy Utah traded that played for Duke, that power forward that got traded there. But anyway, the other exception I want you to pay attention to is the excited utterance exception. The excited utterance. Is that excited? Like happy excitement? Excited utterance. Uh, a statement. Excited statement exception. Excited utterance. Pretty cool. Now, imagine if a sibling was in the top bunk bed. Let's go back to the contemporaneous statement for a moment. Just to give you an example. The sibling's in the top bunk bed. Older brother Mikey's in the top bunk bed. Gabriella's in the bottom bunk bed. And Daddy's in the bottom bunk bed with Gabriella, and Mikey is in the top bed, and he, he hears this. Daddy, you, you're tickling my coochie when you touch me there. Stop rubbing my coochie with your finger, Daddy. Just touch it nice. <laughs> Walk in the... <laughs> you investigate child sexual abuse? I mean, I'm not even going there. This child is saying what's happening. And the brother would be the witness. If the child was saying what was happening and commenting on the molest as it was occurring, that would be a contemporary statement. Mikey could come in and say, I was in the top bunk and I heard my sister Gabriella say, Daddy, you're, you're whatever I said, you said, you're hurting my coochie. Do it softer. Do it softer. Okay? That would be a contemporaneous statement. She would be saying it as it was happening. It would be an exceptional hearsay rule. There doesn't need to be anything exciting about it. It just needs to have been said at the time it's happening. Now, an excited utterance is considered reliable and has special believability because that statement is made when somebody's really, really excited. They're nervous. And they make a statement, and they don't have a lot of time to think or reflect. They simply make a statement in the heat of the moment, under the stress of nervous excitement. And the courts have found that those kinds of statements, those kinds of statements, are admissible because they have special believability, special trustworthiness, or what they really say is they have enhanced reliability. Enhanced reliability. I had a case once where an eight-year-old girl, an eight-year-old girl was in the car with her stepfather. The police went up the east side park in Patterson. They, they saw this car park. The park had long closed. But here was this car. And they saw that the windows looked a little foggy. They were on a side path. They thought they were teenagers or 
young lovers or somebody that was there that wasn't supposed to be there. Maybe they were smoking drugs or doing something. But they knew that it shouldn't be there. They were going to investigate. When, when they began to pull up, they saw a man's head pop up, and then they saw a little girl's head pop up. They saw him dive in the front seat, take off. They go on a high-speed chase. He eventually crashes through a fence and into the back of this factory. They pull him from the car, and they pull the little eight-year-old from the car, shivering, crying, and sobbing. And she tells the lady police officer who arrived how daddy was putting his finger in her vagina and, and licking her vagina in the car. She was hysterical, never mind excited. Those statements, I put that lady police officer, the woman police officer, on the witness stand to say what the little girl said. I also put the little girl on the witness stand to say what happened. Unfortunately, she recanted. So the police officer, the woman police officer who arrived at the scene, was a critical witness. Okay. If the police officer who documented what happened did not include a level of detail that convinced me that that child made an excited utterance, we might not have successfully prosecuted him. Because that child came in and said it didn't happen. Nothing happened. Well, now I coupled or connected the police, the car, the guy jumping, the little girl in sobs, telling the lady officer what happened. And those statements came in for the truth of the matter. When the woman police officer came in in this case, she testified about what the little eight-year-old daughter girl said to her. That was an out-of-court statement offered in the courtroom so the jury believed that it really happened. That's hearsay, pure and simple. But we got it admitted as an excited utterance because the child was in a nervous, agitated, hysterical state when she said it. Of course, when she came to court, she said none of it happened. Go ahead, Al. Uh, would the 911 dispatcher listening to the kid describe some sort of abuse? Yes, yes. Well, look, if it's happening at the time the call comes in, you know, that would be a contemporaneous statement. If you want to have, have excited utterance examples, all day and all night, just search on YouTube for 911 calls. They are classic excited utterances. Okay? The battered spouse ones. He's in the house now. He's coming to get me. Oh my God, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's doing the other thing. You can tell from a variety of factors that it's, it's an excited utterance. I'm going to show you a video clip now. I want you to get out your pens. I want you to report and document what facts there are what facts there are that you would put in your report to document this as an excited utterance? Okay? Assume that the person who makes the statements about the man who did the shooting died. And we needed a witness, and we had to call the police officer who spoke to her in this clip from Law & Order. Now we're in a tough situation here. And if your report doesn't document what facts are demonstrative of any agitated state that the witness might have, we may not be able to convict this guy and a killer would go free. So let's take a look and see what you would document. Family. I don't know how many family reunions that lead a police 
keep their front door. Less to protect us from them, the paranoid street community. That's who killed Richard Durbin. We felt gay, straight, undecided DNA while making arrests. Thanks for your cooperation. Community relations force for Okay, some guy got shot. His name is Richard Durbin, right? There was a witness. She was interviewed, and she gave information. You saw her, right? What would you write down in your report? Well, is this an excited utterance, perhaps? Yes. So if the witness needs to be in a stressful situation, they need to be making a statement under the stress of nervous excitement, what would you document? What about what happened there? What about what you just observed is demonstrative of agitation, nervousness, and excitement that would make her statement come in? What did you see? What would you write down? Eric? Okay, what was she doing with her body then? What do you mean by that? She was standing, she was standing with her arms folded. She was telling the police officers, you know, she was closer, she had been arguing with him and then got shot. She didn't see his face, but she just doesn't see anything going forward. Okay, you're, you're telling me the narrative she gave, which we want the jury to hear. How do we know that a woman who was excited said that? What, what, what was she doing or not doing that made you believe she's excited? She, she didn't see Okay, well, we're not saying she's hysterical. I'm not talking about the second interview. I'm talking about the first interview. Was there anything about her speech or what she was saying that made you believe that? It's just clear on both accounts. We think it's exactly what she said the second time. That's the first time. But the first time, what about the first time? I saw him. I saw him. Yeah, we were going, she was moving her arms a little bit in the beginning. She was moving her hands a little bit. She, her voice was a louder. What about her voice? What else about her voice? Go ahead. It was high pitched. It was rapid. She was trying to get her words out. She was speaking haltingly. Okay? This was subtle. This wasn't like the little girl I described, ah, screaming and crying. But you need to look for the subtleties there. And they were there. Her voice. At a high pitch in the beginning. You, you, I'm going to play it again. You need to contrast that with the second time. Now, again, nobody's saying she's flipping out, but her behavior and her mannerisms are different the first time from the second time. The second time, she seems a little bit more calm. The first time, she seems a little bit more agitated. Go ahead, Carmen. The first time, she wasn't asked anything. She volunteered. I saw him, officer. That's right. He wearing a green coat. He ran towards second. The first time. The first time. Right. The second time he wore a green coat, she didn't see his face. Green, green coat, she didn't see his face. Okay, now that you saw her again. She's out of breath. She's swerving back and forth. She's pointing. What about her jewelry? One of my colleagues always noticed her jewelry. She's going to write it down. She got them long earrings. They're swinging and going back and forth like a pendulum. And that's okay. Those are the subtle, those are the little things that make it clear. This wasn't somebody who was passive and quiet and reflective. This is somebody who just witnessed something. That is almost a contemporaneous statement. In fact, it may very well be, right? I mean, it was just happening. Now, it's not 
she's not saying it as it's happening, but the guy just ran down the street. It's almost a contemporaneous statement. There's not a lot of time to reflect at all. And she's clearly, in the first instance, in an agitated state. And she's speaking haltingly. She's out of her breath. She's waving her arms and flailing them a little bit. She's having a hard time expressing herself. So those are the kind of things that you want to write down, okay? And we will see you next week for Learning Module 7.